and welcome to the NRMN Health Research Talk. I'm Ann Smith, and today I'll be talking with Dr. Monica Baskin. Dr. Baskin is a professor of medicine with the UAB Division of Preventive Medicine, and she'll be talking to us about community-based participatory research. What is it, and how do you do it? Dr. Baskin, welcome. Thank you very much. So today I'm delighted to be here to talk about um, community-based participatory research, or CBPR, um, which is something that I've been working on for the last 10, 15 years or so. Today we're going to focus on defining what community-based participatory research is, or CBPR, talk about the nine guiding principles of CBPR, discuss the importance of CBPR in health disparities research, um, then also provide examples of some of these tools in action and discuss some of the challenges as well as the opportunities of doing this work. Dr. Baskin, what is CBPR? Very good question, Anne. So CBPR, Community-Based Participatory Research, um, is a methodology that is focused on including members of the community, the target audience, in every aspect of the research. But before I get into a little bit more about um, explaining how that is, I want to talk about what traditional research usually is about. So when I mean traditional research in communities, what I'm talking about is what um, some might refer to as a parachute model. That means people like myself, researchers, um, we get a grant funded um, based on a research question and a set of hypotheses, and then we go into communities and collect the data, and then we come back to our offices, we analyze that data, write up reports, and hopefully be able to start that cycle all over again with getting more research questions, more funding. Um, some of the challenges with this particular model, though, is that communities often feel like, you know, the researchers here today, they're gone tomorrow. Um, sometimes communities feel, feel as if there's no or very limited benefit to them. Um, you know, you come in as a researcher, you collect your information, you go away, um, but what does the community get? Um, there's also not a whole lot of attention paid to what the community itself is interested in, mm -hmm. and there's also a perception that there may be um, some distrust there or a lack of trust between the community member and the researcher. And oftentimes this type of model doesn't really think about what happens when the researcher leaves. Mm -hmm. The other issue with traditional research in communities is, you know, unfortunately there's research that suggests, suggests that, you know, it really doesn't work. A lot of problems happen when researchers come in and then they go out and they don't involve community members. Often that's the case because their interventions aren't specifically tailored. Um, so they don't ask, you know, what's really relevant in your community or how can we adjust this to cultural issues. Um, they also don't, you know, have any particular interest in, um, you know, things that the community might have to give. And so the, the assets and the value of the community members. And then lastly, there's a, typically a focus on individual behavior change. So most community-based research um, says, you know, you need to stop smoking, um, or you need to um, get off the couch and get more physically active, or you need to um, push away from the table, you're eating too much, um, as opposed to looking at the full context of human beings living within communities, and there may be other things beyond the individual that may make a difference. So that leads me to actually a more formal definition about community-based participatory research that came out about 15 years ago from the um, Kellogg Community Scholars Program. Mm -hmm. This particular definition highlights a couple of key things. First of all, it focuses on collaboration. This is a collaborative approach. Next, it also recognizes that there are unique strengths that each person brings to the table. So not just the researcher with all the academic training, um, but it also recognizes the assets and the strengths that come from community members themselves. And then there's also an issue of equity. So there's equitable partnerships happening. So that means that there's some give and take in terms of who has the power in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, there are a number of researchers that have um, spoke a lot, lot about community-based participatory research, or CBPR. Um, Dr. Barbara Israel and colleagues um, really wrote the book on CBPR and encourage um, listeners and, and viewers to really go back and look a lot at those, um, those publications. But in a highlight, there are about nine principles that really make up this method. 
The first one is recognizing the community as the unit of identity. So before I mention, a lot of times people are focused in on just the individual. The individual needs to change behavior. Um, but this type of method looks at you know what's going on mm -hmm. at the community level as well and recognizing again that individuals are embedded in families um, as well as embedded in communities. The second principle um, discusses the idea that you want to build on the strengths and resources within a community. Oftentimes we can go in and we hear all the things that are wrong. You know, you don't have sidewalks, you don't have grocery stores, you don't have other things that might help support a lifestyle of good health promotion. But when we start with strengths, um, oftentimes that's a better place to engage individuals mm -hmm. and really build on a solid foundation. Mm -hmm. The third principle is again highlighting that issue of collaboration about equity and having that input at all phases of the research. So not just in terms of providing community input when you need to collect data on community members, but it's getting input from the very beginning. You know, what is the research question that's of interest both to the researcher but also to the community member? Um, what are some of the hypotheses or things that we think might answer me the answers to those questions? All the way from writing grants um, to the very end in terms of how you communicate that information. The fourth principle really is about promoting co-learning. So co-learning means that as a researcher, I'm still learning um, and I'm learning from community members at the same level that community members are learning from me. So again, that mutual beneficial um, relationship where you're valuing and respecting um, the value that each one brings together. And it's also about capacity building. So along with that co-learning, um, the capacity is being built for the researcher, but it's also being built for the community. The fifth principle focuses on balancing out the knowledge generation from action uh, for mutual benefit. So in, in research, in academics, you know, we're focused on um, answering research questions, um, going ahead and advancing science and knowledge and getting our publications out. Um, but for community members, they want to see action. They, if you identify something as um, problematic in a community, they want to see social change. So there's a need to balance out um, what academics kind of need for promotion and, and to satisfy um, the, the university with what the community needs to satisfy community members. And that's a delicate balancing act that I'll talk a little bit more um, as we go on. The sixth principle is about making sure that there's some locally relevant um, public health benefit that you're doing with your research. So from a national level, we look at a lot of epidemiological data and we can say, you know, there are disparities that exist, whether or not it's based on gender or race or ethnicity or some other larger characteristic. Um, but we need to make sure that whatever we're identifying for that research question, there's a local relevance. Why would people in this community that you're targeting, why would they be um, um, basically interested in this? The last few principles, the seventh one is talking about systems development um, and that being a cyclical kind of an iterative process. So that means that as you get in new information, you feed that back. That information might then turn to some adjustments that you need to make and then you kind of keep going around and around where it's not a situation in traditional where you get information and you only deal with that at the very end. Um, it's a process that's very dynamic that you're continuing to make improvements as you get information. The eighth principle is about getting that information, disseminating it out to everyone. So not just the, the, the journal articles and the top tier journals, but also making sure that community members, community stakeholders get that information in a method that they would find digestible. So not just those journal articles. And then lastly, um, probably most importantly, I think, is the idea that this is a long-term process and commitment. Unlike the traditional research where you're here today, gone tomorrow, CBPR really is a long-term long commitment um, where you want to be involved in these communities for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the spirit of um, world-renowned game show, um, I thought maybe I would pose um, 
you know, just a pause here and um, give you a little bit um, of a taste of, of trying to answer this particular question. Um, so in the format of Jeopardy, you know, I have the answer and what I'm looking for is to see who knows the question. So the answer is 17 years. So I'll give you a few seconds to see if you can figure out what question I'm, I have this answer for. So could it be along the lines of how long does the process take? Very close. So the actual question is, what is the time lag in translational research? So what we're talking about in terms of researchers getting a grant funded to the time that whatever that grant, that research is being replicated and it's ready for prime time. It's ready to get out there either in clinical care or in community um, programs. It's ready to be translated. So on average, it's about 17 years before that happens. So it's like uh, my oldest daughter from the time she was born mm -hmm. to about where she is right now, mm -hmm. um, about to turn 17, um, getting you know first car, license, and so forth. That's a very long time. Um, when we talk about health disparities in particular, we know that there are lots of problems um, that people need more immediate answers to. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things in our traditional work has that have led to this long length of time are things that I think CBPR can help to reduce that so that we can get programs and treatments out in the hands of community members um, much sooner. So part of what happens with CBPR is it helps to develop interventions that are more relevant, more successful, and easier to scale up. So it focuses researchers and providers to really listen to one another. So you kind of cut out the, the, some of the time by making sure that before you design that program, you actually know what it would take actually to get people to, to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it also combines, again, that wealth of knowledge and experience that community members have already so they know what's reasonable, what it's going to take to actually recruit the participants that you're looking for, um, what does the design need to look like, um, how can you get people to be compliant um, to actually do the things that you're asking them to do, and CBPR can also bridge some of those cultural gaps, um, not knowing, for example, um, what it means to say certain terms with a particular population. And then also, it can build more trust. So part of the issue um, when people come into communities and they're researchers and they're coming from the ivory towers, particularly of larger universities, there's an inherent distrust. You know, what are you coming in for? Particularly if you're just here today and you're gone tomorrow. So I think CBPR helps to build that trust. It helps also to provide some resources into the community, things that can stay um, in the community long after the program and the researcher have left and it can set the stage for also increasing diversity. So by engaging and sometimes employing members of the community, you can get them involved in research and perhaps get them excited about things to come and how they may be involved in the future. So tell us, Dr. Baskin, how can you get started? So I'm sure it seems like a very daunting task, the way I've described it. It's a long-term commitment. A lot of things go into this. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of strategies that we've used in our research over the last several years. So one technique that we've used is called photo voice. And so it really goes back to that, you know, the golden rule of a picture is worth a thousand words. So photo voice is a particular type of research method. It's based, it's theory based, and it's based on the idea that individuals should really analyze and think about the problems that they have and they've seen, mm -hmm. and that they're a better judge of, of being able to take a greater in-depth look in that than, than people from the outside. It's also a method that's focused on participation, so participatory action um, where participants express their lived experiences. Um, so, you know, we really don't know what it's like to live in someone else's shoes. So it's the idea that those individuals can give us that firsthand knowledge um, by combining pictures, hence the photo, um, with their voices and their description, which is the voice. Mm -hmm. So that's how photo voice comes together. So 
photo voice adds really that tangible or that visual element to the participatory process. It can assist in engaging community members by making them really a part of the research. Mm -hmm. um, and it can help both in terms of planning research, but it also can help with policy issues. And it can come back and also help in terms of assessing what's worked and what has not worked. Mm -hmm. There are three main goals of photo voice. The first one is to enable people to record and reflect upon their community strengths as well as their concerns. The second goal is to promote a critical dialogue. So this is a conversation as well as knowledge exchange about personal and community issues through very large or sometimes small group discussions about those photographs. And then the third um, goal is to re then take that um, visual representation of community experiences and then engage policymakers and stakeholders and other folks into that active part of actually coming back and doing some kind of social change. So there are several steps in doing photo voice. The first one is usually an informational kind of session. Um, so this is where you bring in members of the target audience, your community members, you tell them what photo voice is, you know, very simple terms. Again, you know, you're taking photos, you're then talking about them, you're combining those two things together. Um, you also talk about, you know, what is the theme for that photo voice experience. So you want to give people, you know, some direction about what it is that they're going to be taking pictures about. You also want to, with community members, kind of go through some guidelines, um, if you will, or some instructions about photographing responsibly. So talking about things like what should you take a picture of, what should you not, and avoid, um, so that you aren't, you know, um, infringing upon other people's rights to not have their photographs shown. Um, then we also talk to them and, and instruct them actually about using a camera. Um, you know, cameras are very prolific now in our society, either on our phones or, you know, in other different ways. So we really talk to them about um, certain things about how you use those cameras. And, and then, you know, have them try it out as an example um, there in that first session. The next part is really then sending people out and about to take those pictures. So you usually give them a particular time frame. It could be a couple of days, it could be a week or longer, depending on what your research question is. And people go and they take those pictures. Um, again, they're giving some, some specific instructions about things and ideas that they may want to capture um, relevant to that research question. And then oftentimes we'll give them a log um, so that while they're taking pictures, so they can jot down, you know, oh, I took a picture of um, this grocery store today, or I took a picture of this walking trail as I was going along. And that information can help later on when we come back to the photos and try to, to look at those. The third step then is getting those cameras back from community members and then you've got to either process it if it's using the old school technology of actually having actual film or even if you're using digital photography you want to come back and download those and organize those in a way that you can come back to. Um, so in photo voice whereas um, in traditional work you might have a survey and it has a specific ID number. Uh, for photo voice each picture has its own ID number so that's essentially a piece each picture is a piece of ID so we want to organize that um, in a way and label those photos. Um, we also want to pair them down. So, you know, for example, if you've got um, 15 members of your community that are taking these pictures, they may be taking anywhere from 24 to 36 pictures each. Um, you're not going to be able to talk about each one of those when we come back together in a focus group. So you want to pair those down and select some of the ones um, as a research team you think are really exciting. Um, but you also want to give the opportunity to the community members to select some as well. So we, we look at that, we organize it, and then we set up our focus group. So that's where um, a lot of wonderful things happen when we can see what the individuals who took the pictures thought of their own photos. Which leads to that fourth step. Um, so we want to reflect and discuss the photos in that step. We're going to give the photos back. Um, so we actually, particularly in a lot of our rural communities, we um, produce physical pictures that we hand to each individual. We give them a little packet of their own photos. Um, we give them also, you know, they have their log books and we ask them to also rate and rank their own photos. So they pick their top two or three um, that they want to share with the full group. 
And then when we have all those photos together, we, we go through a very systematic process to evaluate each one of the photographs. Um, it, this particular method that we use is called the SHOWED method, S-H-O-W-E-D, where S stands for, you know, what do you see here in this picture? The H stands for what's really happening here. Um, the O stands for how does this really relate to our lives collectively? Um, the W is why does this problem or condition or strength exist in this community? The E is what can you do to educate other, others about the problem, the condition or strength? And then the D is what can we do about it? Again, getting to that last part of action. And then finally, after that focus grouping, you go through all that information. What we're trying to get to is that last step, community action planning. Um, so again, it's a process where you want to get to do something about it. So not just collecting information for the sake of analyzing it and getting a publication and sitting it on the shelf. It's to use that, that participatory process to figure out what are some things that we can really do something about and engaging stakeholders to, to actually move that along. Mm -hmm. So um, there's certainly a lot of strengths with doing, using this methodology of photo voice. Um, first and foremost, it can really be adapted very easily to participatory goals. You can do needs assessments, you can do mm -hmm. mapping of those assets, um, you can also use it for evaluation. It can work in, in most any community um, you can think of. Um, it's not a lot of um, very skills uh, um, set that it takes um, to be able to snap a picture. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives a lot of voice to people so that they can feel like they've been engaged in the process. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and some of the issues that you might have traditionally with surveys and other kinds of methods of collecting data um, related to literacy, we really get rid of. Um, mm -hmm. the, the first session where we teach people how to use the camera um, usually does wonders and, and most everybody can get it on the first try. Um, but it also allows to get a lot of more detailed information. People are very surprised at how much detail you can get from a single picture. Um, so it can give you a lot of wealth of information, um, but also give you sort of a snapshot of what's going on from the perspective of that community member. So it's not you or I going into a community and we're looking around and we start see certain things. It's the perspective of the people who have that, again, lived experience. But at the same time, you know, there's some disadvantages, um, as you can expect with most, me most methods. Um, you know, the cost of photography and equipment. Um, so, you know, you can go from very low tech with disposable cameras to very high tech with, you know, digital cameras. Um, and so there are, you know, trade-offs depending on what you do with that methodology. Um, sometimes we send equipment out and it doesn't come back, or sometimes we send it out and it comes back and it's no longer operational. Um, so that can be challenging. Um, if you're using the disposable camera, sometimes the quality of film is not as ideal. Um, and, you know, photo voice is empowering and the community kind of must trust the process that if we put this out here, that people are going to be respectful and useful of that, uh, that data. And, and so that can be sometimes a challenge uh, um, to having that done. Um, and sometimes also in the focus groups when we're talking about challenging concepts that showed method, um, that's a little bit more abstract for people. So sometimes it's uh, difficult to understand how what people are taking a picture of could be a concept. Um, and then, you know, obviously there are issues of staffing and coordinating and photo processing and making things happen. So um, what does it look like in action? So, so we've talked about sort of it in theory and mm -hmm. how it works, but um, I've used this in several projects. So I picked one particular one to kind of showcase what it really looks like. And this is a project we have in um, focusing on cancer survivors and trying to develop a, um, a multi-level program. So not only focusing on the individual, but also looking at the community and how we can implement a health promotion for individuals to hopefully prevent cancer um, from recurring, but also prevent it from individuals from not having cancer. So we're really focusing on lifestyle behaviors, nutrition, physical activity, and weight management. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, what we did was we got a group of volunteers. Um, these were individuals in their local community, and we asked them to do the photo voice project for one week. 
Um, we gave them clear instructions. We wanted them to take pictures of things that really would help them to lead a healthy lifestyle, as well as pictures that we thought um, that they would take pictures of things that would maybe get in the way or hinder them from healthy lifestyles. And then afterwards, again, we brought them in um, for a focus group discussion. So um, I'll walk through a little bit about what they, what they did and what they showed us. So um, we had a series of nine different communities that we were focusing on. So I selected a few things here just to highlight. So um, in particular, here are some things that people said were things that supported a healthy lifestyle. Uh, on the left, um, someone took a picture of um, an individual who's working in a garden. And um, what came out of the focus group is sort of the, the description at the, at the bottom of that picture. Um, so someone talked about this as being you know, good exercise um, as one issue, that people working in their garden can get lots of exercise, and this can support healthy lifestyles. But other comments came about, well, the person is also in a garden. You get fresh vegetables there, and that can help with a healthy lifestyle. Another person, again, since we're talking about cancer prevention, highlighted things around, well, you know, your own gardens, um, they're not likely to have some of the pesticides, um, which may be carcinogens. So again, in a single picture, we're getting lots of different information um, from individuals, not only the person who took the picture, but also people in the group. On the right side, people, um, someone took a picture of frozen okra and peas and things that were in their freezer. And again, you can see how people talked about different issues there and how that might relate. Um, another um, individual took a picture of a church in their community and said that this was really related to healthy lifestyles as a place of worship and that that could be related to healthy lifestyles and healing. But it's also a place where you've got great resources like a large parking lot where people can be physically active. Mm -hmm. um, on the right, similar thing, it's also in a church, um, but it's uh, showing some fresh produce that was available for purchase and to be distributed at a church as well. So again, in a picture, getting lots of different ideas that may help support a healthy lifestyle. Other things, um, people took pictures of parks and what was available there, or tennis courts and volleyball courts, again, highlighting things that were really strengths and those assets that I mentioned before that are really prominent in CBPR. So starting where people have great things that they can build on as opposed to always focusing in on the things that are not going so well. And then, you know, here are some pictures of things, again, from the perspective of the community mem members, where things might have been getting in the way of healthy lifestyles. So on the left, there is a walking trail. So, you know, great that there's a walking trail, but this one is in disrepair. Um, so the, the concrete there is broken up, um, some exposed dirt. And so, you know, they talked about somebody needs to, you know, really fix this because people could be walking there for physical activity, could get tripped up and actually could hurt themselves. Or on the right side, you know, an old swimming pool. Again, great that this amenity is in the community, but if no one's taking care of it, um, you've got, you know, it's, it's, you know, not being taken care of, then that might not be a place where people would want to come and swim. Um, similarly, in rural areas, we saw a lot of um, roads where there are not sidewalks and buffers for people to be physically active. Or on the left, you see a very large truck, and so you've got major highways that come through, and that may be more dangerous. Or on the right side, a bridge that was really cutting across a community, and but not a lot of places where people could walk on there and feel safe. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, you know, someone talked about and took a picture on the left of a vacant building. And so while some people in the audience um, for the focus group talked about, well, this could be a place where, um, you know, things could be happening where um, there could be things like people could be hanging out there and selling drugs. There may be crime that may be happening. Um, but other people talked about it as a way where this is a this is a space where we could do something that's more um, more about health promotion and of having an abandoned building. And my personal favorite is the one on the right, um, advertisement for fast food. So um, a, a commercial uh, or advertisement for a local um, uh, fast food restaurant that pairs you know, um, the, the restaurant and fast food, hamburgers and chicken um, with being a superhero. Mm -hmm. So again, some mixed messages there um, in terms of advertising. 
So then what do we do with all of that? So we use it at the start of the project to be able to get a better sense from the perspective of the community members of what things were going on at the community level that could help them or get in the way of them leading a healthy lifestyle. So we were able to identify some clear structural barriers and use that to focus on the strengths and build on programs that could you know, really work with the resources that they had. Um, but we also looked at things that might be available for intervening. So we focused our intervention as we developed it on targeting those environmental factors that may get in the way of even the beneficial individual programs that we had um, focused on weight management. So uh, you've done some of it. Uh, how do you keep on going? Yeah. So I think, you know, this second method that we've used um, has also been beneficial. So in addition to photo voice, um, we've, we've talked about an idea of um, how do you also come up with what's really key in sort of developing that research question. The second method we've used is called concept mapping. And it's the idea of getting you know, the individual thoughts and input to kind of go into the middle to get one clear uh, concept of what the intervention needs to look like or what the program might need to look at. And this is a much more structured kind of a way to, to um, hone in on that idea. It also is very much participatory, so it follows along with the CBPR method, um, and, uh, but it, it also um, has a, a sense of taking those ideas and presenting them, again, in a graphical way and having some maps. It helps the researcher to capture those ideas from multiple people and then to formulate um, something that's much more structured by taking a, a group brainstorm idea, you know, session to really honing in on what things are likely to be easier to do um, but are really important at the community level. So just like the other method, it, the, this method happens in a sequence of steps. The first method is what we call brainstorming. Um, and this is where you get together, again, in a focus group setting where participants are asked to answer a single question. So sometimes, you know, focus groups can ask a series of questions and so forth. This one is unique um, in the sense that it's only one question that people are asking, and it's one that we think um, may, may be really honing in on solutions. So this particular idea, this question is asked, and participants go around and around, sort of in a round robin kind of fashion, where each person is asked to answer and respond to a question. And unlike more traditional focus groups where you're audio recording, this one is really live. We kind of write down the, the responses as people go. We put them up so everybody can see them. And for the first round, we ask people just free flow. You know, what do you think is a response to the question? And we put that down as is. And then we go back in a sep second um, phase and we say, well, tell us a little bit more about what you were talking about so everybody can really understand what it is that you mean by that item. And then you go back and you edit real time the list. You either add on things as people think more about the issue or you might say later on, oh, well, you know, that response there, number 20, I don't really think that that one's relevant anymore. And then at the end of that brainstorming session, you really have a consolidated list of things that people think really answer that initial research question. So you take that through and, and so the, the research team kind of gets that consolidated and then you bring the, the group back together again for a second meeting. And this is where you try to sort out those ideas and you really try to rate those. So you can get to a process where you take, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 ideas and you pare it down to something that's more manageable. So this is where we sort, um, we give them a, a card sort, basically. We take each of the statements they created in the brainstorming session, put them on an index card, um, and then we give them a stack of those cards and you ask them, uh, each participant, to basically sort those, um, that stack mm -hmm. in piles of things that they think are similar in meaning. Mm -hmm. So no one stack can have all of the statements and then you don't have a series of, say, 50 stacks with one thing in them mm -hmm. it, itself. 
And so you have them to stack them. And then you say, you know, why don't you rate each of these items as well on a scale of how important this thing is to you or relative to the other statements and how easy or difficult you think it would be to change something about that. So that, that set of data comes in to us as well. And then we go back as a research team, we take that information together. And it, again, similar to Photo Voice, it's a little wealth of data. So if you think about um, all the different ideas that come out, all the different participants, they're sorting, they're rating, all of that. And so our team, thank goodness, has the benefit of using a software program where we input all of that information in. And the software program is able to spit out to us um, using some more advanced statistical methodology, kind of what things were really resonating and coming to the top of the list of, out of the combined stacks and what things were rated more highly. So we then come back in a final meeting with our community members where we call our member checking. And so we re review those maps that came out of the computer. We edit those down. Um, we also verify and make sure that the community members say, okay, this makes sense and it's similar to what we told you. And then we also get some potential um, suggestions for them about um, programs and interventions. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, two ways that it's in action. Are there uh, other ways to put it into action? So I think, you know, that's uh, again the theory of concept mapping. And so I want to talk a little bit about in action, what does it look like? So, okay. um, so, so walk through a little bit about a program, um, a project that we had a few years ago, where we were really trying to figure out what are the social and cultural um, um, factors that influence physical activity among adolescents, African American adolescents in particular. So we have a research study, and again, you can read a little bit more with one of the publications, but we had close to 70 African American youth here in the local uh, Birmingham area come together. They were between ages of 10 and 15. Um, majority of them were female, and they were about 13 on average. So we asked them um, a series of questions, and they went through this concept mapping um, process for us to sort of develop some ideas about how to intervene to get adolescents more physically active. Mm -hmm. And we focused on that group because that's a population um, right before um, middle school age where you start seeing a drop off of physical activity, um, particularly among African American girls. And so if we can get in and intervene, um, we can really have a big change if we can figure out how we can keep them at a level of physical activity that would help them to remain healthy. So we had these multiple sessions. Our first session, we wanted the participants to come in and they answered a single question. What about your family, your friends, and your community encourages you to be physically active? So we really wanted to focus on that positive aspect. And then we brought them in for the second session. So they sorted the final statements into piles and we asked them to rate them based on what's most important versus least important. And then we did that analysis again through our software system and we came up with um, 84, or the brainstorming came up with 84 items. And then we really sort of pared that down into some clusters. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. So for those um, 84 statements, we, we had the boys separately to answer those and prioritize those. Um, we had them separately for, for boys versus girls. Um, so this is a list of what they came up with their top 10. So in answer to that question about what it, with your, your family and your community encourages you to be physically active, um, what boys talked about, they talked about um, you know, wanting to be physically active to be a good role model to their peers. They also talked about you know, things that will help encourage them and be supportive would be having year-round sports activities. Mm -hmm. And then their third one was about teamwork. So again, thinking about out, uh, for those adolescent boys, those were the top three things that came out in terms of their, their stacks and what was important and meaningful to them. For girls, on the other hand, they talked about, you know, really being encouraged by their family members. So someone in their family really talking about being more physically active um, to help them to live longer and to be healthy. That was really important. 
Teamwork was also in their top three, but it was a little closer to the top um, than for boys. And then um, for girls, something that was different from boys, they really talked about your family really encouraging you um, to be physically active, and that was really more meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And so this is what it looks like in a map. So again, taking all of those stacks, those 84 stacks from those almost 70 individuals, when we put that into the computer, um, these nine core themes came up. And so just orienting you a little bit to this screen, you have different sort of geometric shapes there. And those shapes are created by literally um, connecting the individual dots. So each of the 84 statements represent some dot that's there in that map. But those statements that were more closely lumped together when we asked people to sort them based on things that were similar in meaning, meaning then they're likely to be around that particular um, geometric shape. Um, the shapes that are closer together were also similar um, versus the shapes that were further apart. You may also see there that there's different levels of those shapes. So sometimes you see, you know, a, a, a more depth, so layers of, you know, sort of what looks pinkish or reddish there. And what that means is the, the, the ratings that we ask about people, what's more important or least important. If it's more important, then they have more layers. If it's least important, it has less layers. Mm -hmm. So what this was able to do was group those individual ideas into these nine concepts, if you will, um, that we looked at. And for the boys, again, it's those top three things that I mentioned before, plus these other six issues here that they rated. And so this was, um, you know, slightly different than what we saw for the girls. So again, some of the items were there and sometimes they were in a different order, but, and, and you can see that sometimes some of those things were less important, meaning that they have less layers than some of the other layers. But again, in terms of a participatory process, it was easy for people to kind of see how things group together by looking at these pictures. The other way the software comes out, it shows us this ladder, if you will. And again, looking at things differently for boys versus girls. So um, the ladder itself, with if the rungs are going you know, across equally, that means that girls and boys were about the same in terms of how um, they would rate this in terms of importance. But sometimes you'll see that those rungs aren't directly across from one another. So one thing may be more important or higher, higher, more highly valued by one group than by the other. And so that's important. So if you're thinking about programs um, and if th things are all the same and people have similar priorities, that it may not make any sense to sort of separate out by gender or by some other characteristic. But if you see that there are clear differences, then they may give you pause as a researcher to say, well, you know, there may be benefit to separating out girls from boys in this case. So from this particular um, method and tool that we used, we really got a sense of, you know, how to sort of frame an intervention for physical activity and promote that among African American youth. We knew that we should again start from some of the strengths in the social and cultural environment. So how how well teamwork may play into it, how much family members may play into it, how well peers and role modeling may play into it, were all things that we had to think about as a team and how we could incorporate that into our future program. Um, we also knew that family-based interventions or programs um, that involve parents and other family members may be more successful because both boys and girls said that that was something that was important to them and came out in sort of their top 10. And then again, as we saw, there were some differences between genders. So we as a team said, okay, we need to think about how we might split up boys and girls when we're trying to intervene because they may need different things in their programs. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities of CBPR? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I think it's a great method. I, I um, clearly have been doing it for a number of years and, um, you know, want to make sure that um, I, I talk up some of the great things. Yeah. But I also want to be realistic and say that there are some possible challenges um, with this method as well. So I mentioned very early on that there is a balancing act. Um, so this particular um, figure shows that on the left end of the spectrum, you have what's more traditional, that expert-driven research, um, where you've got the researcher, 
I'm knowledgeable, I have the training, um, I in fact have um, a research question, I've got an idea about how to answer it, and so I'm gonna come in and then I'm gonna leave. That's on the left side, that's the expert-driven research. On the very tail end of that, on the right side, is totally community-driven research. It only comes from the community, the community is involved, um, there's um, you know much more involvement. And where I think CBPR and in, in realistically is somewhere in the middle. It's where you've got some participation, you've got involvement from both sectors, and there's that shared power dynamic. But you know sometimes that may be more challenging. So realistically, um, as a researcher, I'm bound by what I may have been writing in a research grant and a funding agency. Um, so it well it may not be quite as participatory as I like. Um, by having community members part of that discussion and writing the application, I can feel a little bit better than that. Um, so again, it's a balancing act there. Other um, particular challenges, I think, um, in the kind of work that we do, we often hire members of the target community. So, um, and as I do work um, primarily in, in other areas of the state and even in other states outside of my home institution, mm -hmm. that means that I've got staff that are hours away from me. So maintaining that great enthusiastic staff um, and supervising them is a, is a challenge when you have people that are so far away. Um, sometimes people can manage that very well. Other times people need to have um, a little bit more hands-on for that accountability. The other part is maintaining human subjects protection, which is extremely important, particularly in working communities. Um, but that means that we have to have our community members that are constantly going through continuing education, they're remaining certified with our institutional IRB, and um, making sure that, that that training is using terminology that they can understand. Other challenges um, with this work I think um, we've experienced in our work is that, you know, it's very costly. Costly financially, but also in time. Again, trying to get out, um, making sure that you are engaging community members at each one of those levels means that um, you may be a little delayed in your timelines because you need to meet with individuals. You also have that cyclical process where um, you might think you're going down, going down one path and that's going well, and then somebody says, oh no, we can't do that and you've got to go back to to the drawing board. It's also um, a challenge in, in our um, thinking right now in terms of our, our funding, um, being able to maintain when you have those programs going from one three to five year funded program to, a, to the next. You've built up oftentimes a great relationship, a good um, team, and so that, that bridge between getting one grant funded and the next funded is one that causes a lot of angst, I think, for a lot of CBPR researchers to make sure you can keep that going after that next program and have that sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, translating findings to community members, is, it may also be a challenge. Um, researchers are really great at writing um, journal articles. We're probably not as great at writing articles in the lay public and mm -hmm. doing some of that work, um, but, but that's part of our learning. We've got to make sure that what we learn, um, we value what people have given to us, so we've got to give it back to them. Um, and then sometimes CBPR is still a little bit challenging in top tier journals. Um, while, where I, while I think that's changing a little bit, people are recognizing it as a legitimate um, research methodology, sometimes it's still a little bit hard to convince that, um, you know, some publishers and editors that CBPR is worthwhile and it's valuable as well. But I also want to leave on their opportunities. There are really great things about CBPR. I don't think I would have done it for the number of years that I have if there weren't very mm -hmm. um, much rewarding um, aspects of it. So there has to be a critical dialogue between community members, researchers, providers, policy makers, um, if we want to do anything about reducing that time, that 17 year um, time frame. We've got to get that lowered so we get great programs out to the people who need them most. Uh, and so I think that's a very, very much a benefit and opportunity of CBPR. Um, using some of the methods that I mentioned here today, photo voice, concept mapping, and many other ones that exist, are a way to have people to build that trust because they are part of the process. They can see readily how information they give you helps to drive and direct the programs that you're developing. So engagement, I think, is really important and is a process to a way to build that community trust and respect as well.
We also know that CBPR is, you know, I think just starting to come of age in more traditional research funding like the National Institutes of Health. Um, NIH has funded several CBPR projects and programs um, and again peer-reviewed journals are starting to come around so I think there are some opportunities there mm -hmm. with more innovative programs to be funded even by um, funding agencies that have traditionally not done this work. Um, and you know, first and foremost, there's still so much work to be done. So um, I hope to encourage and get people excited about it um, because I could use a helping hand. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, you know, concluding thoughts, I think, you know, CBPR is really a marathon. It's not a sprint. You don't come in and out. Um, it's rewarding, um, as I hear. I'm not a marathon runner, but I hear people um, get really excited about it and say at the very end, uh, wow, I'm glad I did that. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage people to think of it. Um, but everybody benefits from it. Again, this mutual co-learning, I can say as a researcher, but I, every time I go out in communities, I learn something new, um, that it doesn't matter um, how many years of training, how many other degrees. Um, it's been a worthwhile experience for me to learn, and hopefully we're contributing to not only the literature, but we're contributing to making changes that are really substantial in communities to help reduce cancer disparities and other disparities that exist as well. So mutual trust and respect are essential, being true to that CBPR model, and a need um, really to evaluate sort of the cost benefit. Again, it, it's very costly, so we need to take a look. You know, what are we getting from it? Are we getting um, the benefit from it? Can we reduce healthcare costs? Can we um, reduce other kinds of costs that are associated with it? Um, and so I think we've got a lot of great things to come with CBPR. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Baskin. That's a fascinating way to involve the community in the research and get answers and get their participation yes. in developing the questions and finding solutions. Okay. So I want to invite all the viewers, if you have questions for Dr. Baskin about CBPR, to email me at the email address and I can direct them to Dr. Baskin okay. and um, we can collaborate on these things. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Baskin. Thank you. Thank you for watching this health research talk. We encourage you to email us with any questions or comments. Also, please take a moment and complete the brief survey on the link on your screen. Let us know what you thought about it and how we can improve it for the future. Lastly, register on the NRMN website to sign up for the online mentoring and be a part of NRMN, the National Research Mentoring Network. Thank you.